Well hello Internet and welcome to my prologue video tutorial. In this one tutorial I'm going to cover pretty much everything you would read in a standard prologue book in one video. Because many of you guys have told me most of the books on prologue are very poorly written or are hard to understand, I'm going to specifically emphasize numerous examples on prologue to clear up the language and make it very understandable. In the description underneath the video I have timestamps for all the different parts of the tutorial so you'll be able to click on them and go to directly whatever you want to learn. And also in this tutorial, because numerous people have asked me, I'm going to show you how to install numerous different languages, including C++, the most requested on Windows. So you may be asking yourself, well, what exactly is Prolog? Well, Prolog is just quite simply a collection of facts and rules that we can query. And Prolog is going to focus on describing facts and relationships about problems rather than creating a series of steps to solve that problem like you might see in another programming language. And these facts and rules are going to be stored in a file called either the database or knowledge base, as you're going to see. And why don't I jump over and show you how to install everything. Okay, so if you're on Mac, this is going to be very easy. All you're going to have to do is go to brew.sh and install homebrew. That is all you're going to have to do, and you can see all the instructions right here. Then what you're going to do inside of your terminal is just type in brew install gnu prolog, right like that, and hit enter. And then inside of that same terminal, you'll be able to go to whatever directory you have your prolog files stored in or your prolog database stored in and type in g prolog, right like that, and you're ready to go. Now let's go and look at exactly how we can install numerous languages on Windows, including prolog. Okay, so this might seem like a lot of steps, but it's really not. You're just going to go to sigwin.com and install.html, or you can just come over here and click on install sigwin. And then you're going to come down here and click on setup x8664.exe. And that's, of course, is going to say, do you want to run or save this? And just click on save. And then you're going to have to give it access, click on yes. And then you're going to click on next. And then you're going to leave this on install from internet and click on next. And this is perfectly fine. Click on Next. Direct Connections, fine. Click on Next. And you can choose any of these different sites where you'll be able to download. Normally, I just let it select whatever it selects automatically and click on Next. And then after all that installs, you're going to see a window kind of like this. What you're going to want to do is come down here where it has DVEL or Development and click on that. And whenever you do, all this stuff's going to open up. What we're going to do now is cycle down through all these different lists of data until you see GNU. And you're going to see that right here. And here is going to be all the things you're going to want to install. And you're going to want to make sure that you come in here and click on binaries for all of these different guys. GCC, Core, GCC, Fortran if you want Fortran, G++ if you want C++ to be able to work. And there's a couple other. Here's ADA and Objective-C and all those different things. Might as well just go ahead and install all of them. You don't need to install Fortran, however. And this is going to work for Prolog as well as C and C++. And you can see I also have a check here for the GNU debugger. And you're going to keep on scrolling. And then also you're going to want to get the make right here. Make sure you check inside of that. And I think that is everything. Then after you do that, you're going to want to come over here and click on Next. And whenever you do, it's going to say, do you want to resolve all the dependencies, install everything? Yes, click on Next. And it's going to take a while to download and install. And then after it is all installed, you're going to see a message like this. And then you can decide if you want to put an icon on your desktop or in the Start menu or whatever and click on Finish. Okay, all that's installed. Now we have to install. Prologue. We're going to go to gprolog.org and there's a couple different flavors of Prologue. I'm just using gprolog because that works out best for me. And you're going to look at what you want to install. You're either going to get one of these Windows versions right here and everything's going to install directly for you. And make sure you install this one right here. See Sigwin over here? And this is going to auto install. So you're going to click on that. And then this little wizard is going to open up and you're going to click on Next. And then you got to pick the location. I just left it at the default and click on Next. And here is our Prolog console. And we get that just by clicking on the little icon that's going to launch that for us. And this is going to work exactly the same way it works on a Macintosh or OS X or whatever. And what you can do is you could go into the folder where you have SigWin64 Home. And then it's going to be your name. And just to verify that C++ and everything else is also installed because, of course, I wanted to make sure I covered 
remembered how to do that, you can just create hello world.h right like this, and then type in everything you see right here inside of here and save it. And if you want to see exactly where I have this stored, SigWin64 home, see, there's my name, of course, it's going to be your name. And then what you're going to want to do is just go inside of a terminal and you're going to want to go to SigWin. So you're going to get another icon on your desktop that's going to look like this guy right here. You're going to click on that. This is in Windows, of course. And then you can see the process of everything that I'm doing right here just to verify that C++ is installed. And there is everything, and there you can see Hello World printed out. So feel free to pause your screen if you want to and check that out just to make sure that SigWin's installed and C++ is installed and everything else is installed. And of course we know the Prolog's installed because we were able to open that up. So that is everything you need to know about installing everything on Windows as well as on Macintosh. So let's start writing some code. Okay, so as I was talking about previously, all your facts and your rules that you define are going to be stored in a file called the database or the knowledge base, and that is this guy right here. I just called it db.pl, that extension is important, and this is going to be the knowledge base where we're going to store those facts and rules. Now you're going to be able to load those inside of here. Well, well, first let me show you how to exit out of the gprolog system. You're just going to type in halt like that and period, and there you go, you're back to your terminal. And of course you're going to be able to load everything just by going gprolog right like that. You're also going to be able to load your database. It's empty right now, but to load your database, you just have to type in a little bracket like that, and then DB, and then a closing bracket, and a period, and there you can see everything compiled and everything is ready for us to work with. You could also come in here and type out the much longer consult, and then db.pl like that, and that's also going to load the database, but you can see I actually typed that in. Make sure you put another quote right there, and there you can see there's another way to load it. But of course, this is a little bit shorter, so this is what I use, this guy right up here. Another thing that's going to be important once you are able to have some things in your database is you can type in listing and then a dot, and it's going to show you a whole bunch of information about the contents of your database. And all of these commands, as well as most of the commands inside a prologue, are called predicates. So why don't I do a very simple hello world thing. Again, this is the terminal, this is the text editor or the knowledge base. If you wanted to do a hello world, you could just go right and then hello world. And then you're going to, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of different ways to output stuff. If you want to do a new line, you just type in NL like that and you're going to divide everything up with commas and then right and let's say let's now I have a opening quote right here so to define a quote inside of the string I'm going to do a backslash with a quote like that and I can do this and program and I'm going to close this off with a period like I always will and there you can say hello world and let's program prints out on our screen and once again NL is for new line so let's come over into our database and let's define something so let's say something like loves Romeo and Juliet now what this is saying is Romeo loves Juliet. And in this situation, this is going to be a fact where loves is going to be what we call a predicate. And Romeo and Juliet, these guys right here, are called atoms, which are going to be constants. And also, of course, they are the arguments that are going to be passed into the predicate loves. And I might as well go in here and also do a little bit of a brief introduction of much of what you're going to say. If you want to define a rule, you're going to use something that looks like this, and that's the same as if we would say if, like we're very accustomed to in other programming languages. And here we could say loves Juliet, Juliet loves Romeo if, and then we could say or refer to this guy right up here, Romeo loves Juliet. So this is a rule. Juliet is going to love Romeo as long as Romeo loves Juliet. And that is quite simply what we're saying right there. And of course we're going to save that and then we're going to also come in here and we are going to load our database right like that. And we can come in here and check to see if indeed Juliet loves Romeo right like that. And you're going to see that yes comes back as our answer. Now as you're reading through books or you're reading online, also facts and rules are referred to as clauses. And now to close the intro part off, I'm just going to briefly talk about variables. Now a variable is going to be an object that we can't name at the time of execution. Now unlike our atoms that we saw previously, such as Romeo and Juliet, a variable is always going to start with an uppercase letter, while they will always start with lowercase letters. And what's great about variables is they are going to allow us to answer questions. So if we 
want to find out who loves Romeo and we don't know, we can just ask our terminal and it's going to come back with Juliet. And those are the basic things you really have to understand about prologue to really get to understand the language. It's really a simple language that does certain things extremely well, but it is very easy to get confused by it because you may be used to other languages in which everything is done in a step-by-step -step manner. But I'll do my best to clear everything up. So now let's focus in here more on facts and cover more complex examples. Now basically with a fact, you're going to write the relationship first, followed by objects between parentheses, followed by a dot. And as you can see right here, this is a fact that Romeo loves Juliet. These guys are always going to start off with lowercase letters, and then they're going to be able to contain letters, uppercase letters, numbers, as well as plus, minus, underscore, multiplication, division signs, and a whole bunch of other different things, which you will probably never use whenever you're defining them. But anyway, you're able to use them. Just make sure that you never start off an atom with an underscore. It's also useful to know that you would be able to define instead of saying something like Romeo's dog with an underscore, like you would very commonly do, you would also be able to use white space in here as long as you put this between quotes. So that's something else that you can do, however it's not very often seen. So now I'm just going to define a whole bunch of different facts inside of my database, and it's very important whenever you're defining these that you keep all of your predicates, male, 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 all these guys all in one area. You don't want male and then another male down here. You want to keep everything all nicely and organized. And then of course if you go in here and you do this, again, always remember to load your database. You're going to be able to come in here and fact check or check that these facts are indeed true quite easily. Another thing that's kind of interesting is we can type in listing and then mail like this and then get a listing of all the males and of course you could do that with all of the females as well. And another thing that's interesting is we could get a male and then throw a variable inside of it and female and throw a different variable inside of it and this is going to show all the combinations of male and female together and how we, whenever you see a little question mark after this, how we cycle through all of these guys is we hit a semicolon like that and it's going to continue cycling through all the different versions of male and female until there are none. And there you can see we got to the end of it. And that is really all you need to know about facts, so why don't we talk about rules. So let's go and let's get some of these guys out of here. Okay, so I went and threw in a couple different facts about our different people that we're working with here. And I'm going to talk about rules. Now, rules are going to be used when you want to say that a fact is going to depend on a group of other facts. And we're very often going to define these rules by using a guy that looks like this, which is the same as saying if, as you're going to see in a second. So let's say that we want to say that Albert runs under certain circumstances. So we're going to say if, we're going to say Albert is happy, and then follow that with a comma, and then, eh, actually that's enough. So let's just put a dot inside of there. And you can see, in fact, that that is going to be true. Load our database, and let's check if Albert is running, and you can see that Albert is running. And that is a rule. That is a very simple rule, but that is a rule. We're also going to be able to check multiple conditions, as I was just going to show you there a second ago. And you're going to do that with a comma, which is also the same as saying and. So let's say that we want to say Alice dances if Alice is happy and Alice is with Albert. And then put a period at the end of it. And then we can check if currently Alice is dancing. And you can see that in fact she is. So there's two simple rules. And of course, all of the code you see here is going to be available in the description underneath the video. So you should get it and use it as a cheat sheet or something like that. We're also going to be able to come in here and define our own predicates to keep our commands brief. So let's say something like, does Alice dance? And then we're gonna say if, so does Alice dance is gonna be our predicate. And we could say, dances Alice, like this. And then we could also come in and issue a write command. So we could say, when Alice is happy and with Albert, she dances. And then close that off with a period. And then we could come in and just say, does Alice dance, just like we did with all the other predicates. And you're going to say that when Alice is happy and with Albert, she dances, prints out on the screen, exactly as you would think. Come in, create a couple more rules. It's very important to know. Let's say we go swims, so Bob swims if Bob is happy and near water. If we type this in, come over, and then check if Bob is swimming, you're going to see, uh-oh, uncaught exception. And why did we get that? Well, we got that because we did not define a fact 
called near water. So that is one of the reasons why we got that error. If, however, we would go and take this up here and throw that in there as a fact, then of course it would execute. And it's also very important to know that not only do all the predicates need to be defined, but also in the situations where you're using AND right here with the comma, that both these conditions must be true for this rule right here to be considered true. We could also come in here and define two instances, and if either of them comes back true, then the answer is going to be yes. So we could say Bill swims when Bill is happy, and then also come in here and swims Bill, and it's still going to work even though we have not defined a fact called near water for Bill or for anything. And you're going to see that that's true if we come up here and do this, and then we say swims, and then pass in Bill. You see that that comes back true. And yes, indeed, Bill is swimming. So it's possible to define different predicates or different rules that all depend upon different conditions, all with the same name. Now we'll come back to rules, but let's focus more on variables here for a second so that you completely understand exactly how they work. So let's get rid of all that stuff. Now a variable is going to be an object, like I said before, in which you're unable to be able to name it whenever you're writing your program. Now what sets variables apart is they all begin with an uppercase letter or an underscore, and of course they're going to be able to contain all the same symbols that I talked about previously with atoms. There we go, throw a couple facts inside of there, and now of course we're going to be able to come in here and load the database and use a variable. And I use X a lot, of course you don't need to use X, and this is going to spit out all of the different females that are inside of our database. And I'll throw a couple more facts inside here to get things a little bit more interesting. So there we are defining Albert is the parent of Bob, Albert is the parent of Betsy, and so forth and so on. So we'll be working with that information. So let's load our new database inside of here, and let's go and query this guy. So let's say that we wanted to find out everyone who is the parent of Bob. We would just do it this way. And there you can see that Albert came back as well as Alice comes back. And then the no right here means that there is no more additional x's or values that could be assigned to x. And it's also very important to know that the same variable name or x like I've been using whenever I've been issuing queries like this guy right here that are used in two completely different questions represent two completely different variables. So they don't go from one to another and retain their value in any way. They basically disappear as soon as the rule of the query ends. Okay, so I added a couple of additional facts in here so we can do a little bit more complex little questions here. Always update your database. And now we could say something like, who is the parent of Bob who also dances? Uppercase letters, of course. And you're going to see that Alice comes back and that there's nobody left after that. Now we could come in and do something a little bit more complicated. So, for example, let's say that we wanted to ask if Carl has grandparents. So we can work our way up through the system. Now this is where logic comes in. What are we going to do? Well we're going to look for a parent of Carl and we're going to look for one of the Y's right here that comes back as a child. So we're looking for who are Carl's parents and is Carl the child of an X parent And you can see right here Albert and Bob pop back and the Bob part, of course, is going to be Carl's father. And we can also see that Alice also comes back and that there's nobody else in the results. So that's one way to think through a logical way of looking at these things. We could also come in in a similar way and try to find Albert's grandchildren. So the first thing that we're going to say in this situation is, is Albert a parent? Then after we do that, we're going to say, does his children have any children? So we'll be able to say parent, throw the X in there, which represents a child, and then we'll throw a Y inside of there. And those are going to represent the children. And here you can see back that Carl comes back, as well as Charlie comes back, and that there's no further results. So that's a way to find out if he has any grandchildren. Now we're also going to be able to come over here and create a custom predicate to basically get multiple results. So let's call this get grandchild if, and here we'll say parent Albert, and we're also going to say that you're going to be able to pass these values inside of here so we'll be able to do even more customized things. And parent, and x, and y. And now we'll be able to come in here and write out Albert's grandchild is, and I'll show you a neater way of printing stuff out here in a second so you don't have to type in write a million times, but this works for now. And now we'll just be able to go in here and go get grandchild like that, and Albert's grandchild is Carl pops back, and also you're going to get Albert's grandchild is Charlie also pops back, and there you can see are all the results for that query. 
We could also come in and do something like check and see if Carl and Charlie share a parent. How we would do that is by saying parent x again for our variable parent put the x inside of there and then throw Charlie inside of there and you can see the Bob pops back and there you can see that there's no further results. Another way to print things out is to use format to get your results. So let's just change this to get grandparent like this. Here we're going to change this to x and we'll change this to Carl. Leave this as x and change this to Charlie. And then we're going to get rid of all these write statements and use format instead. So we'll say format. Now if you want to put in a variable here, you're going to put the tilde with a lowercase w. If you want to transpose a string inside of here, you're going to put a tilde and an s. And then we're going to say grand parent. And then you're going to put a new line inside of here using format with a tilde and an n. And of course you can put a space inside of there if you want. Then inside of here, inside of what we're going to learn more about later, which are called lists, put these brackets. X is going to be the variable you want to transpose inside of here. And then for the string you want to use, you're going to go is the inside of there, right like that. And of course close that off. And we'll of course be able to jump over here, load our database, and then go get grandparent and Bob is the grandparent pops back and you can see that there is no further results afterwards. And I went and threw another fact in here that Bob and Bill are going to be brothers. And let's say that we want to check if Carl has an uncle. So how would we do that? Well we could say that we're looking for a parent for Carl and of course we don't know who that is. And we're also looking for brothers in which that parent has a brother. And of course let's just go and copy this and throw it over here. Paste that inside of there and there you can see that Bob pops back as the version of X which is going to be Carl's parent and you can see here that Bill is the brother of Bob. And you can see also that there's no further results. Also I'd like to come in here and demonstrate axioms and derived facts. Let's come in here and define grandparent which is going to receive an X and Y value as an attribute. And then we're going to say if parent. We're going to throw a Z inside of here and an X and then parent again and inside of here we'll go Y and Z. Now what this is going to allow us to do is to go grandparent. Actually I don't need that space inside of there but since I did it whatever. And we'll be able to go Carl and then we'll be able to throw A inside of here. What this is saying is we want Carl to go in here to the X position. Y is still going to be a variable inside here that we don't know anything about. And then A is going to represent a value that's going to be passed out after this predicate is done executing. And if we do that you're going to see that the grandparents of Carl come back both as Albert as well as Alice. So that's another way to work with our predicates and pass parameters into them. Also very important to know, let's say we have blushes x if human x, that if this value on the right is true, then this value on the left is going to be deemed true as well. So if we come in here and define human as Derek, that we'll be able to come in here also and go blushes and pass Derek inside of it, and that's also going to come back as true. So you can see how these rules and these different facts all play off of another. And to finish this off, let's do another example. Let's say that we want to say that Tybalt, which is from Romeo and Juliet again, is going to stab Mercutio with a sword. And henceforth, Romeo is going to hate X if X stabs Mercutio with a sword. And of course we're going to be able to do that and check that out. And another thing we're going to be able to do over here in the terminal in a second is there's something else called an anonymous variable. Let's say for example that we wanted to check for the existence of the predicate mail right here. But we did not care about any of the values that are in the predicate mail. We could also do those with what are called anonymous variables. First off let's go and let's check hates if Romeo is going to hate anybody and just throw that in there and you can see the Tybalt pops back and also you can see whenever we use an anonymous variable which is just an underscore we're going to be able to check for the existence of the male predicate without getting any additional results however it's going to pop through there for all the different results but we can just hit enter to close that out and see that yes in fact there is a predicate called male. So one thing you may be asking yourself is, where is if? Where are conditional statements? Well, there really are no if statements inside of Prolog, except
except for that guy right there. However, you can pretty much knock them off with a sort of case statement sort of way. Now remember, we're going to be able to define the same predicate name multiple times and then accept different results and then act on them. Well, one thing we could do is we could define a predicate called what grade, and in this situation, we'll say five, or what we're going to do if five is entered as a value or a parameter for what grade. And in those situations, say something like go to kindergarten and then close that off. What we'll then be able to do is define what grade again, but in this situation, we're going to perform a different reaction if their age is six, like this. And in this situation, we'll say something like go to first grade. And there we see that that works. Then we could also define another predicate, which is gonna cover any other situation. So we could give it a different name, our variable here, let's just call it other. And in this situation, we could say something like grade, define a variable, and we'll be able to perform an arithmetic operation here by going grade is, which is the same as saying equals, and then we could say other minus five. So we're gonna take the value of whatever they pass in here, subtract five from it, and then from that, let's use format here again. I just like to bounce around and use different things. We could say something like go to grade, and then our tilde and our w, and then of course after that inside of brackets put grade and then close that off and you can see that we'll be able to come in here execute that and then we can say something like what grade and then let's pass five inside of here and you'll see go to kindergarten pops back and also we'd be able to come in and say something like what grade for every other result say something like 10 and see that it automatically pops out the information that we would expect. So there's a whole bunch of different ways to work with variables and predicates and a whole bunch of other different things. Now we're going to go and take a look at complex terms or structures. Now a structure is going to be an object that's going to be made up of many other objects or components. And structures are going to allow us to add context about what an object is to avoid confusion. For example, let's say that you had defined a fact inside of here, which is Albert has Olive. Now you may ask yourself, well what exactly does that mean? Does that mean that Albert has a pep named Olive or that Albert actually has an Olive that now maybe Albert wants to eat? Well structures are going to allow us to clear that up. Now basically a structure is just going to have what's called a functor, which we can just have right here. You've already seen these guys, followed by a list of arguments. So for example, if we had female Alice, female is going to be the functor, and also it's important to know that the number of different arguments inside of here is referred to as the arity inside of Prolog. So in this situation, female has one arity, or one parameter, and that parameter is Alice. So let's get back to our little Albert explanation here. We could also say something like owns and Albert, and then pass in inside of here pet. And then in here, we could provide more information. So Albert has a pet cat named Olive is exactly what we're saying, and it helps us avoid any confusion that would have came from just using what we had previously. And of course, if we would then come in here, copy that inside of it, paste this inside of there, and then maybe take all of out of here altogether, you're going to see that all of pops back as a result. More constructively, we could also come in here and create some customers, Tom Smith, and he has a balance of $20.55, and Sally Smith, who has a balance of $120.55. So let's define those two facts. You're going to see here in a, another example of an anonymous variable. Come in here and load that information in the screen and say something like customer. And let's say that we want Sally or information on Sally. We do not care about Sally's last name. And we specifically want the balance to be pulled and stored inside of the variable called balance. And there you can see that's a very easy way to do it. And another use for an anonymous variable. We could also come in here and define our own predicate. So get customer balance and it's going to get first name passed inside of it as well as last name. And we're going to say if customer f name last name and balance and then we'll be able to go right f name. Another thing we can do with right if we want to throw a space inside of it we could just type in tab one that would be the same as saying we want one space inside of something but format works a little bit better so let's just use format here tilde w o's us throw a dollar sign inside of there. If we want to take the balance and we only want two decimal places worth of values, we just put a tilde inside of there followed by a two and an F and that's gonna do that for us. And then of course we'll come in and say, let's just say we want the last name and the balance to be output. We'd then be able to go get 
customer balance, and then pass in Sally Smith and see that Sally Smith owes us $120.55. We could also come in and do some really neat things. So let's say we wanted to define something like a complex term that shows exactly what it means to be vertical versus being a horizontal line. Well, we could do that. We could say vertical and we could define a line that's going to have a point that's going to be x and y as well as a point that is going to be the same value of x and a different value of y. And there you go. We just defined what it means to be vertical and we could also come in and define what it means to be horizontal in much the same way. So we could just take this guy right here, throw that inside of here, and what's it mean to be horizontal? Well, it means that we have the same value of y, but we have a different value of x. Define that inside of there. And you can see over here that I have a warning. It's called singleton variables. You're basically going to see that anytime that you define a variable that you don't necessarily do anything with, and sometimes that's an okay warning and sometimes it isn't. In this situation, it would be okay. So what we're gonna do now is come in here and ask if a specific piece of data for vertical is actually going to be a vertical line. Let's just paste that inside of there. Change this to five, change this to 10, change this to five, and then change this to 20 or something. If we execute that, you're going to see that, yes, indeed, that is a vertical line. And we could do the same thing for the horizontal line and get the same sort of results. I could also come in here and change this 5 and then put a 6 inside of there, and you're going to see that this is not a vertical line in that situation. Another thing that's interesting is we can actually ask what the value of the point should be if it's vertical. So let's just throw that in there again. And in this situation, let's go to the 6 part and change that to x, exactly like this. And here you can see that it popped back the value of x. Even better yet, we could come in and type in something like vertical and pass in line and point and five and 10, and then ask it for the x and y's that would be required to make this vertical. Close that off. And there you can see that it doesn't matter what the value of y is as long as the value of x is equal to five. So that's an introduction to complex terms and structures. And of course, we're gonna be seeing those later as the tutorial continues. Now let's jump over and take a look at how we can compare values inside of Prolog. Now of course we're going to be able to do things like say is Alice equal to Alice and it's going to come back as yes. We're also going to be able to come in here and say is this equal to Alice and you're going to find that yes indeed that also is equal to Alice. We'd be able to come in and check to see if things are not equal by just going backslash and then a plus and then Alice is equal to Albert for example. And you're going to see that that comes back that indeed Alice is not equal to Albert. And that's exactly how we would figure that out. We could also come in and just do arbitrary things like is 3 greater than 15? No. We'd be able to check if 3 is greater than or equal to 15. Also no. Or we could come and check if 3 is, and this is how you do less than or equal to, like this and that's 15, and that also comes back as no. And the reason why they do that is so that these don't look like arrows. It's some arbitrary prologue thing. Another thing that's interesting is we would actually be able to go w, which is going to be a variable, and go like this, and you can see that that comes back in true. And this is basically saying that we can assign the value of Alice to w, and not necessarily that w is equal to Alice. So that's what, what's going on there if that confuses you at all. Another thing that's true in an equal way is we'd be able to come in and go rand1, which is a variable, is equal to rand2, and indeed those are also going to come back true. And this basically just says that any variable can be assigned to anything, and one of those things is another variable. And another thing that's true is, let's say we go rich is equal to money, x equal to rich, y, no debt, completely arbitrary types of things, and you're going to see that this also comes back in true. And the reason why that comes back as true is this is going to be equal to this if we can take this variable right here and assign it to this money right here and this x right here can be assigned to this no debt. If those two things can work for each other, then both sides are gonna be equal. So there's a rundown of equality and how it works. It's very important to figure those things out because it's very easy if you understand them to then be able to handle a lot of errors and get yourself out of errors. Also another thing that's very interesting or that is good to know about is trace because it's gonna really help you better understand how Prolog works, how it processes data, achieves goals and comes back with either whether things are true or false. So what I did was I went over here and created a couple different rules for ourselves. So we have penguins and humans and whether or not they are warm-blooded, produce milk, or have feathers. 
And then I had to find a rule down here on whether something can be a mammal or not. It must be all those three things, and you're going to see exactly how this works because we're going to use trace. Go get our database all loaded. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on trace. This is often used for debugging inside of Prolog. And you can see there the debugger is all set up. And now what I can do is I can go mammal like this and pass in human like that and see exactly how it's going to be processed. So you can see right here, the very first thing Prolog does whenever I hit it with one of these questions is it says, well, let's pass over human to the mammal role, which is what we have right here. Then what we're going to do is we're going to check, is the human warm blooded? Because that's the first thing in our list. And you're going to see that it exits out of there and everything seems to be okay. Then it's going to ask, does it produce milk? Exits out of there, everything's okay. We still don't have a failure, so we're going to check again, does a human have hair? Yes, it does have hair. That is the last goal or clause that we must meet for a human to be considered a mammal. And there you see, we're going to exit out of the mammal predicate or rule that we defined and then answer with the value of yes. Alternatively, what we could do is come in, of course, and do the same exact thing with penguin. And this is very important. If you've ever getting confused about how exactly rules are working inside of Prolog, then turn on trace and just check it out. So here we're going to check if a penguin's real or a mammal anyway. And so you can see it's being passed over to there. It's being checked to see if it's warm blooded, comes out of that okay. Then it's going to check if it produces milk, comes out of that okay. Then it's going to check if it has hair, and you can see that it fails right there. And that is the entire process of how we're going to be able to walk through all these different guys. And of course, if you want to shut off trace, just go no trace, right like that, and the debugger is switched off. Also, likewise, we could come in and say something like warm blooded X, just as a review, produce milk, and what does that? And then we could come in and say something like write X and then a new line. And you can see that both the penguin pops back as well as human also pops back. So different ways of working and comparing and walking through and better understanding exactly how Prolog processes all these questions that we pose. Now let's take a look at recursion. I went in here and defined a couple different rules that we're going to be able to work with. So let's say if we wanted to come in here and now that we have this information about who are parents of what children, let's say we wanted to come in and check out exactly how we would find out if someone in this list is related to another one. Now we just go related, if, and then we're going to define exactly the situation in which they are related. Well, there's going to be a parent, X and Y, of course, and this indeed is going to work for us if we get a very specific relation. So for example, we could go related and we could check for Albert and Bob and know that that's going to come back as true. However, if we would come in here and do something like related and then we would type in Albert and Carl like that, if something that we know definitely is true, it's going to come back as no. So how can we work around that? Well, one of the ways we can work around that is through using recursion. Now what we're going to do is we're going to keep this in here because it does work pretty well. However, we're also going to come in here and we're going to define a little bit more specific. So let's say we go X and Y and if, now what we're going to do, jump over here, we're going to say parent and here we're going to say X and Z, something that we do not know about. And then we're going to call back related once again and Z and Y. So it's a little bit more complicated. So what we're going to do in this situation, let's just use Albert and Carl as an example. Well, Albert and Carl pop in here. So Albert, Carl. So we check. Is there a situation in which Albert, let's put Albert in here for X, is the parent of something Z other than Albert and Carl? So yes, that indeed is definitely going to be true because Albert is the parent of Bob, Betsy, and Bill. So we know that is true. Then we're going to take this value of Z, each of them, Bob, Betsy, and Bill, represent this with Z, and then we're going to throw Carl inside of there. So we're then going to pass this back in, inside of it, and we're going to say, is Bob, Betsy, or Bill, which are now going to get the values of X right here, going to be equal to Carl inside of parent? And you can see, indeed, that yes, Bob is the first hit, and here you can see our answer, and that it indeed is true. And now that we have that saved, we can load that and we can say related and then pass in Albert and Carl and you can see that that comes back as true. So that's one way we can use recursion. And another thing that's interesting is we would also be able to come in here and go related like this and then pass in Z 
and Carl and be able to cycle through all of the possible different results, everybody that Carl was ultimately related to. So kind of cool ways of using recursion and of course we're going to look more at those later on. So now let's take a look at a lot of the math functions that are available to us with Prolog. Now Prolog is going to use the keyword is to evaluate mathematical expressions. So we could say something like x is 2 plus 2 like that. That works. You don't need the space. And you can see there that we get the answer of 4 for x. And of course we're also going to be able to come in here and use parentheses or anything that we would like. So we can say 2 times 10 like that. If I typed it properly, 2 times 10. There we go. And there's our answer of 43. We're going to be able to make comparisons of course like you saw previously. So that comes back as yes. We're also going to be able to make comparisons between different expressions. So greater than or equal to, and you're going to see a whole bunch of these. So let's say 50 divided by 2, like that, and that works. Once again, because it's a little bit weird, just want to show you exactly what it means whenever we check for something being not equal. 10, like that, and there you can see that comes back. We'd also be able to check for equality between expressions, but we do this in a little bit of a weird way. We go equal to, colon, equal to, and then we could just do 4 plus 5 or something like that. And then likewise, we could do inequality between expressions by going equal sign, and then the backslash, and equal sign, 4 plus 5 like that, and that's going to come back as no, of course. And we'd also be able to check for multiple different comparisons with an OR operator. The OR operator in this situation is going to be the semicolon. And you can also use those OR operations in your rules and so forth. Instead of putting a comma, put an OR in there, and then it would come back as true if either OR of the goals is met. And you can play around with this, and you can see that that works if one or the other comes back as true. We're also going to be able to come in and say x is and get the modulus or the remainder of a division of 7 divided by 2. And there you can get 1. And let's come in and create ourselves a predicate as well. Let's say we want to do something like double digit and it's going to get a value of x and y like that. We could say if and then we could perform some calculations inside of here. We'll say y is x times 2. And then we could say double digit, and let's just double, I don't know, a thousand, and pass in y, which is going to be the value that's returned with our answer. And you can see we got 2,000 there. We're also going to be able to do a whole bunch of other different things, such as generate random values. So, so let's say we want to generate a random value between 0 and 10, and store it in the variable of x. Well, there you go. And you can see there that this is indeed random. Could also you can see more about this as well later on. Get all the values between 0 and 10. We can just go 0, 10, and let's have them stored in x. And you can see all those. We could cycle through them one by one by typing in a semicolon. And just so you see exactly what that looks like. Semicolon, semicolon, semicolon. Say, enter. That leaves. You're going to be able to add 1 and assign it to a value. So let's say we want to go 2, and we want to assign that to the value of x. And you can see that it increments a value. That's used a lot also in Prolog. We can get an absolute value, absolute, and just pass in negative 8, and there that is. We can get the largest of uh, two values. So we could say x is, and then just pass in max, and then say something like 10 and 5, there that is. We could also, in a very similar way, get the minimum value, and there that is. We can round values or convert floating point values into integers. Let's just go 10.56. And there that is, and that's going to round it up. And if it was 10.4, it would round it down. We'd also be able to come in and truncate values. So we could say truncate like that, 10.56, and that's just going to knock off the decimal places there. And there's a whole bunch of these different guys. We can get the floor, which is going to give us the same exact result as we just saw previously. We're also going to be able to come in and get the ceiling, which is going to round up. We could go and get 2 to the power of 3, 2, and then we just put two multiplication signs and 3 in that situation. And you can see that you can do all kinds of different things, like let's say we wanted to create a predicate over here that's going to tell us if something is even or not. So it's going to get some value passed into it, and that value is going to, y is going to get the value of x, and we can do a division by 2, and then also check for the expressions equal, 2 times y. We could save that, jump over here, load that, and then just call is even like that, and throw in 12 or something, is even, and that comes back as yes. 
So as you can see, there's many different math functions. Here's a whole bunch more, and there's even more aside from these guys that I have listed here on the screen. Feel free to pause if you want to go and explore and play around with all those different guys. So now let's take a look at input and output. Now I already showed you write. What write's basically going to be able to do is output whatever you put in between quotes onto the screen. And of course a new line is going to give you a new line. And you can see there that is. We're also going to be able to come in here and go write Q, lowercase, and say something like I show quotes right like this. And that's going to show the quotes around exactly the way they are displayed there. We'd also, however, be able to read input from the user. So let's say we want to create a predicate called say hi. And let's call, do something like what is your name? And then we could use read to read in the information that is entered from the keyboard. And then we could come in and go write and say something like hi. And I showed you format already. I'm just using write here just so you can see different things. And we can say write. X. And then I can come in and do say hi, right like this, and it's going to say what is your name. And you're going to enter in everything that you want entered in there. And we're going to enter it in between quotes like this. And then we're going to follow that with a period. And you're going to see that it comes back as hi Derek. Likewise, other different ways that we can work with uh, characters. Let's try that. We can do something like favorite character is equal to. And when we can say write what is your favorite character, put a comma, and then use git. Git is going to be able to receive one character that it's going to save as an ASCII value to x in this situation. And here we'll use format because format's a lot easier to use. And we'll say the ASCII value, and here we're going to put tilde w is, and throw our x inside of there. And then to output a single character we'd say put x and new line. And then we could go favorite character. What's your favorite character? A. And you're going to see the ASCII value is 65, or the ASCII value of 65 is A. Okay, so there's a couple more functions we can play around with here. If you'd like to write to a function, that's actually rather easy. Let's create another one of these guys here. We could just go call this write to file and say that it's going to get a file name passed into it and the text that you want passed or saved in the file. What you need to do is get a stream for this file. So you're going to pass in the file. If you want to write to the file, you have to type in write. And then this is going to be the stream that we're going to be referring to over and over again. And then we could say to write to the stream, we just go write stream text, the text you want to write to it. And let's throw in a new line. And then to close the stream or the connection to the file, that's all a stream is. You would just do that. Now we want to check that we were actually able to write to the file and the way to do that is to read to or read from the file. So in this situation we'll just pass in the file we want to read from. Of course we're going to need to open the file. So file and we want to read this time so type in read there instead of write. Then what we're going to need to do is read in characters from the file. So I'm going to go get character, pass in the stream, and this will just be character one or what have you. And then we'll say process stream, which is a function I'm going to create here in a second, character one, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to need to check to see if we get to the end of the file or not. And then after we're all done with that, we will close our stream, of course. So now what I need to do is process my stream, and if I ever get to the end of file, I know that I need to stop getting anything out of there. And one way to do that is with what is called a cut. And there's a cut right there. And the cut is used anytime you want to end backtracking through all of these goals to see if they're true or not. So just basically stops execution for us. So it's saying we want to keep processing this stream until we get to the end of the file and then we don't want to do that anymore. Otherwise what we're going to do is we're going to get a character and a stream passed inside of here. And what we'll do is we'll write out that character and then we'll say get character from the stream. Character 2 just to differentiate from those two. And then we'll call process stream again. So we're going to keep calling process stream basically asking for another character from our file writing it to the screen over and over again until we get to the end of the file. So process stream, and in this situation, pass in character two that we got from our stream, and there that guy is, and there that guy is. So if we want to work with this, of course we have to update everything here. Everything is fine. We're gonna say write to 
file like that and we have to tell it the file we want to write to so we'll just say something like test1 I'll put this between quotes test1.text and then whatever we want to write to it we'll just say random string that works well well I spelled random wrong random string good enough and there that is and you can see it wrote to it because it popped back yes and then if we want to read from the file we just go read file like that and we can say test one dot text what we want to read from and you can see random string came back so that's how we can accept input from the user how we can output to the console in multiple different ways how we can output to files and how to read from files now let's take a look at looping now I'm going to use recursion here and how I'm going to end the looping inside of my little application here is I'm going to go count to 10 like this and say that if the value is equal to 10 I'm going to call write 10 like that and then I'm also going to end the calling of count to 10 over and over again so we can go count to 10 and say if it's anything other than 10 what I'm going to need to do is go write x print our value and then I'm going to say y is x plus 1 and then count to 10 once again and pass the value of y inside of it and then you can see there we are and we can go count to 10 like this and throw a 5 inside of there and it's going to count from 5 up to 10 but you probably want to do something a little bit fancier than that so let's say we wanted to be able to work with a lowest value and a highest value and have them count between those so we'll do something like uh, how to count down from a value so we could say let's just call this count down like that and it's going to receive the low value as well as our high value and then what we're going to do is use between like we used before and this is just going to assign the values between low and high to y for us just like it did previous in its last example and there's y then i'm going to assign the difference between high minus y save that to z and then i'm going to write the value of z to the screen followed by a new line and now with countdown what we're going to be able to do is come over here and go count down like that and we can do anything so let's go low zero and we'll go the high is 15 like this and you can see right there we got 15 14 13 and it's going to continue going the whole way until it's zero likewise we could do a count up which is going to be very similar so we'll just go copy this guy and change this to count up still going to receive low and high still going to use between here the only thing we're going to change here is basically going to switch this around we're going to say z is y plus low and then print out everything just as we did before and then count up give it us our low value and then give us our high value and there you can see a zero and it's counting its way up until it gets to the end so there's another way we can loop and why don't we just go and do a little bit fancier loop yet again let's do a guessing game so let's say we wanted the user to guess numbers over and over and over again until they got the value of 15. I'm going to create this guy guess number and it's going to call our loop predicate we're going to create here in a second and the value of start is basically just there as a dummy value that's going to be used to start looping and since our secret number is 15 we're going to say that we want to continue looping over and over again until the user guesses 15 and whenever they guess it you can come in here and say something like you guessed it and close that off otherwise we're going to loop so any other value is going to call this version of loop and we're going to say well we want x to not be equal to 15 of course just as a check we could then say something like write guess number and then we're going to read their guess from the input and then we'll write out the guess on the screen and we'll just do something like write is not the number we know it's not the number because otherwise it wouldn't be here if it was 15 it would go and call this version of loop up here and then we'll just call loop guess again another situation which we have recursion and we could go guess number this is a guess a number i'll type in 10 10 is not the number okay how about 11 nope and how about 15 and you can see that i guessed it i guess i should have put this is not the number up here at the top but either way you get the point of how to loop so let's go in and take a look at how we can i write these this code largely out of my head so little bugs slip in there every once in a while so why don't we go and check exactly how we can change our database yes indeed we can change our database from over here over inside of our database the only thing you need to remember here is anything that you plan on changing, any predicates, 
you're going to have to mark as dynamic at the very beginning of your file or at least before they are ever used anywhere in any way. And what we're doing here is we're saying this is the father predicate that is going to receive two attributes. That's what that means. If there was a predicate here that received three attributes, we would put a three there instead. So that's exactly what those mean. And there's just a little bit of information about Romeo and Juliet. And now I'm going to go in here and mess around with it and update my database as I go and update all this information. Let's leave the stabs part inside of here and let's throw some information in there that we can play around with. Okay. So you can see in a situation in which we would use three because there are three attributes down here for that guy. Now let's jump up here and look at this. Now you can see right here I'm defining the friends of Romeo. Now I could also come through and go Mercutio is friends of Romeo and switch all these up. But let's say that I wanted to automatically update that and didn't want to type that information in. I wanted to instead do that over here on the right side of the screen in our terminal. Well, I could add a new clause to the database at the end of the list. So if I'm going to create a new friend predicate, it's going to come in right here if I use asserts like that. Asserts is going to put it at the end and I'm defining a new rule and I'm basically saying that I want to assert that Benvolio is also a friend of Mercutio. So you can see I went and placed that in there and if I come in I can also verify that. It's in the database but I can verify it. So Ben Volio, is a, he a friend of Mercutio? Yes, it comes back as true. I could also, in a very similar way, instead add the clause at the start of the predicate list by instead of typing asserts, which puts it at the end, I could instead type in insert A. And then likewise, I could go friend, Mercutio, Benvolio. And if I check that, you're gonna see that that also comes back as true. So that's the only difference between asserts and assert A. You can think of it or remember it because A comes at the very beginning. So assert A is gonna put it before right here while asserts is going to put that additional information afterwards. Could also delete a clause. So let's say I wanted to go retract likes. Let's say that Mercutio decides that he does not like dancing anymore. Well, I can do that and I could verify that that indeed has been changed because that comes back as no. I could also come in and retract all situations like let's say that Romeo and Juliet decide they no longer want fathers at all. So there we are. I retract every single father that is defined inside of this guy and they are gone and I could verify that also by going Lord Montague Romeo and you can see that comes back as no even though it's defined right there and let's decide that every single character decides that they no longer like dancing at all I could also use retract all and call likes for everybody and revoke dancing from it and you're gonna see that nobody likes dancing and I could even do that with an anonymous variable dancing and that comes back as no so that's ways to update our database from our terminal right here pretty cool now let's take a look at lists now you're going to be able to store atoms, complex terms, variables, numbers, and other lists in a list. And they're basically used to store data that has an unknown number of elements. Now you're going to be able to add values to a list with what's called the list constructor. And I'm just going to go right and define a list. So here you are, Albert. If I wanted to add Albert to the beginning of the list that has Alice and Bob inside of it, close off that list right like that. There you can see Albert's been added and that's with the list constructor. This guy right here, the pipe or the or statement or whatever you want to refer to it as. We're also going to be able to get the length of a list quite easily. One, two, three, like that. And let's say we want to store that value inside of X. There you can see we got that. You're also going to be able to divide a list into its head and tail parts. So let's just go like this. Again, use the list constructor inside of there and then pass it a list and it's going to get you the head and the tail A and B and C and the head is going to be the first letter inside of the list of the first element inside of our list and the tail is going to be the last ones you're also going to be able to come in here and get more values by just adding them to the left side of your constructor there so let's say X1, X2, X4 pipe inside of there this is going to be the T or the tail B, C, and D. And you can see, got all those different values out of there. We're also going to be able to use anonymous variables, of course, like we've used in so many other different situations in which we don't care about the value. So we could do X2, and then say we want the tail part is equal to, and there you can see it popped back or it grabbed the second element inside of the list and ignored everything else. And we're also going to be able to use that pipe character again to access values of lists inside of a list. So let's come in here and get those 
x, y, and there's another tail. And then we could do a little bit more elaborate list here is equal to. And then we could go a, b, throw another list inside of there, c, d, e, f, let's make this big, g, and h. And there you can see it went and grabbed all those different pieces inside of there and exactly how they line up with all the different list elements. And you can also notice here that we can just pretty much jump all over the place. Prolog isn't very picky when it comes to white space. We could also come in here and define a list. Let's go that and check if A is inside of our list. And you can see that it indeed it was, and then we use member for that. We could also use member to get all of the different items in the list by passing X inside of there. And it's going to cycle through all those for us. And you can see that it's going to give us all the different values that are available. You can do all sorts of things. There's tons of different functions we can use. We could uh, reverse these guys. There's the list items, pass in X, and there you go. You got the absolute reverse of it. You could also use a pen to concatenate two lists. And then let's create another one. Forgot to put the variable it's going to be assigned to. There's X. And there you can see, concatenated those lists together. Now let's do something a little bit interesting with a list. Let's, uh, I'll show you how to cycle through a list so that we will be able to perform operations on list items. So this is going to handle our empty list for us. And then we'll say something like write list. And then we're going to get the head as well as the tail that is going to be passed inside of here for our list item. And then we'll just, in this situation, we'll just keep it simple and we'll write out our list to the screen. And then we're going to use recursion again. And in this situation, pass the tail or the remaining items in our list back into it again. And by doing that, we can just go write list and then pass in some values inside here or pass a list in one, two, three, four, and five or whatever you want. It could be anything. And you could see that it printed out every list item. We could also perform operations on all those list items as well. So here is a whole bunch of information in regards to lists and how we can operate and work with those. Now let's take a look at strings. Now it's very important to understand name and how it's going to operate. Let's jump over here in the terminals. It's easier. Name is going to go and take a string and convert it into a series of ASCII characters. So let's say we have a random string. It's very important to remember how this works because we're going to be using this to do a whole bunch of things. And there you can see there's the ASCII values for all of those different characters. We're then also going to be able to convert the ASCII character list into a string itself. Just have to put the X ahead of time, right like that. And if you do that, you're going to go and grab this guy, paste that inside of there, and you're going to see a random string pops back out on our screen for us. When we go in here and create a little function that's going to allow us to append or join our strings together, let's just call it join string, and it's going to get three strings passed inside of it. Make sure you keep those uppercase. There they are. And now to convert it, we're going to call name on these to convert them into our ASCII characters. And we'll store those in our string list. Let's do that for both of these values. And we'll just change this to two and then change this to two. Now we can come in and combine our string lists into a new string list. So we'll go append string list one and then string list two and then string list and this is going to be three. And now we can come in and go name string three and pass in string list three. It's going to convert it from those ASCII characters back into a final string. And now we'll be able to come in here and go join string like this. And then we'll just pass in two strings together, another and random string. Make sure you put quotes around this, otherwise it's not a string. And then at the end of it, we'll just throw in the variable we want the result to be stored in, which is X. And you can see another random string and that's how we were able to append those strings. You can do a whole bunch of different things here with strings. I could also come in here and get different characters out of a string by just going name and just throw in a name and store that in list like this. And then I could call n and then put an O in there or a zero inside of there. And let's say I want the first, which is going to be the zero index and list for that. And it's going to be stored in F character like that. And then if I wanted to output a character, I just go F character. And you can see the D came out and it also went and printed out the entire list. And then finally, let's also go and show you how to get the length of a string. Just type in atom length X and there you go. So there you go guys, there is a heck of a lot of information about Prolog, definitely enough to get you through any book and hopefully it made sense out of a lot of problems that you guys are having with Prolog. Up next, I'm gonna cover Scala and please leave your questions and comments below. Otherwise, till next time.